Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to welcome you to the uh, session uh, uh, due to begin now, uh, which is uh, to be given to us by uh, Father Richard Conrad, um, who is going to speak to us uh, on the topic Humanity Created for Communion with the Trinity uh, in Aquinas. Father Richard is a member of the Order of Preachers, uh, which joined in 1979. Um, before then, for his training as a theologian, uh, he was a natural scientist and chemist at Cambridge, so comes from studying the Congress with a scientific background. Oh, that's not off the bat, we got it. And has been in the Order of Preachers since 1979, as I said, he's been uh, at, at uh, various places uh, within the community in Edinburgh uh, and in Leicester and in Cambridge and has been based in Oxford uh, for the last nine years uh, and is now the director of the Aquinas Institute. Uh, and gives himself, I must say, Bob, very uh, single-mindedly uh, to uh, a great deal of teaching throughout the university for people who want to learn about the Thomas tradition uh, and about Aquinas. Um, so we're very fortunate uh, to have you here today uh, to speak to us. Marvel, thank you. So I'd like to thank Father George for inviting me and Father Robin for introducing me. By way of promoting the planting of fast-growing trees and sustainable forests, I've made a rather large handout. <laughs> there should be piles at the end of each row. If anyone is without, I have a few spare here. I'm afraid the handout was compiled rather hastily from earlier lecture course handouts and so on. So one of them being short bullet points is rather discursive. It might help you follow what I'm saying, or if I don't finish what I'm saying because of my pride about how much I can fit in, then there's some better time reading here, in case you suffer from insomnia. So I'm speaking about humanity created for communion with the Trinity in the teaching of St. Thomas Aquinas. And as Metropolitan Callistos did yesterday and Lydia did earlier today, I'd like to start by mentioning what Rana has to say, where he thinks that the Augustinian Western, the medieval Latin doctrine of the Trinity tends to separate the Trinity in itself from the economy of salvation. And the way in which St. Thomas places a rather self-contained treatise on the Trinity in his summer means that ever since, the mystery of the Trinity has locked itself up in even more splendid isolation. So I want to help us, as Lydia did earlier this afternoon, recover a sense of the Trinity as a mystery of salvation. I don't want to criticise Rana's project. I think Rana's project was to make the divine self-communication the most fundamental of all realities. What I would query is his reading of doctrinal history. I think he was sharing the concerns of Augustine and Aquinas rather than trying to do something different. And indeed I think he contributed new ideas about how we are made to be receptive to the Holy Trinity. Indeed, if you want to research project as a doctoral or postdoctoral student, then that's one bit of Rana you might want to develop on section C of his book, The Trinity. Of course, there has been recent revisionist history about both Augustine and Aquinas, and I've given you some references in the footnote on page one, but I think we do need to dig into both Augustine and Aquinas, to some extent read between the lines, or recognize that they are both conducting work in progress. 
So the first question I want to ask is whether in St. Thomas's Summer of Theology, the treatise on the Trinity is really self-contained, hermetically sealed. In fact, Rowan Williams has already, in his Aquinas lecture that got published in New Blackfriars in 2001, he has already shown how the treatise on the Trinity in the summer is not hermetically self-contained. You have probably read or heard or watched The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, in which the mice devise a supercomputer to work out the meaning of life, the universe and everything, and the answer after thousands of years of calculation is 42. But that's wrong. <laughs> it's actually 43. I say that as a Thomas. I think question 43 of the first part of the summer is the hinge, indeed the answer, to life, the universe and everything. Many people know that one of the patterns operating in St. Thomas's summer is that of exitus and reditus, going forth and returning. After one question on the nature of sacred teaching, St. Thomas gives us a treatise which Rowan Williams has shown is, as a whole, on the triune God. Questions 2 to 42 are on the triune God, the God who knows and loves himself, as Lydia showed earlier this afternoon, the triune God from whom all things come, to whom all things are attracted. And then question 44 begins a treatise on the Exodus, the going forth of creatures from God. And the long second part of the summer is on what would be involved if a rational creature, a fallen rational creature like us, should journey to its fulfilment in God. And a recurring theme in the second part is the work of the Holy Spirit, the divinizing presence of the Spirit, to craft us in charity and wisdom so that we desire to be together in God and we feel the way towards him. And then the potentially very long Tertia Pass, which Thomas did not live to finish, covers how in historical particularity God made the return to God possible. The Father sent his Son into the world to take flesh, to be our way, and to impart to us by his passion and resurrection and in the sacraments, grace which is, for not often said explicitly, the grace of the Holy Spirit. So a kind of hinge in the summer is that question 43 in the first part. It explains the exitus, why God goes out in creation and then in the great deeds of salvation. Indeed, it launches the main themes of those works. The purpose of God going out is that the rational creature, us, should come to its fulfilment in God. Indeed, the creation of the angels is that they too should be fulfilled in God. And question 43 tells us that each of the Father, the Son and the Spirit wants to give himself to us, to be known and loved, possessed and enjoyed, now and forever. It's that desire of the Trinity to communicate themselves to us, which is why God goes out in creation and salvation.
And for what I have just said, one needs to dig slightly into question 43. Because St. Thomas begins that question, de inde considerandum de missione divinarum personal. Now it is to be considered the mission of the divine persons. And that points forward to the sending of the Spirit and the sending of the Son as the summa unfolds. The second part is about the invisible mission of the Spirit, the third about the visible mission of the Son. But Article 2 of Question 43 introduces the giving of the Divine Persons. So there were two themes, ostensibly mission, but also, if you dig, self-giving. The giving of the persons to be possessed. A divine person is given so as to be possessed by us. One might think of the Song of Songs, I am my beloved, and he is mine. And to unfold this self-giving, Article 3 returns to a theme that Thomas has mentioned earlier in the summer. There is one way in which God is present in all things to hold them in being, to know them and to guide them. But there's a radically new way of God being present in the rational creature as the known in the knower and the beloved in the lover. It is that that makes us temples of God that fulfills the promise at the Last Supper that the Father and the Son would make their home in us and would give us the Holy Spirit. Lana might complain, and perhaps rightly, that Thomas speaks a bit too often of God giving himself to be known and loved, possessed and enjoyed. It is, to some extent, explicit in question 43 that it is Father, Son and Spirit who give themselves to be possessed and enjoyed by us. And how does it happen that we can become temples of God? It's by grace. Thomas's phrase is gratia gratum factions, which we translate as sanctifying grace, but that's almost a bit too technical. It is the divinizing gift of God. It's the gift that makes us gracious, graceful, and grateful. I mean, of course, morally graceful rather than all ballet dancers. It is this divinizing, transforming work of God that empowers us to possess and freely enjoy the divine persons. There is a sense of reciprocity. It is not just that we are known and loved by God, that comes first, but God makes us able to know and love him. And that is why later in the summer, St. Thomas will introduce the concept of friendship, amicitia, borrowed in a sense from Aristotle, but also from Jesus' saying at the Last Supper, I call you friends. There must be an element of reciprocity in friendship, and God sets that up between us and him. The theme of the divine self-giving continues in Article 4. Is the Father sent to us? And the answer is no, because there is no one to send him. He is from no other. But he does give himself. He liberally bestows himself on the creature. 
for her to enjoy. So each of the three divine persons gives himself to us, and the Father gives us his Son and their Spirit. And now we can return to the theme of mission. The Son and the Spirit are given as sent. And that, of course, is an Augustinian theme explored in the first half of the day Trinitate, but made perhaps a bit more precise by St. Thomas. A divine person is given if he becomes present in the world in a new way, in the incarnation or the indwelling of grace. And he also has to be sent. He must be from another person who can send him. And it's as if the divine processions of the Son from the Father and the Spirit from the Father and the Son are projected into the world. So in the life of the triune God, The Son is from the Father, and in Western theology, the Spirit is from the Father, and the Son, or from the Father, through the Son. That is God's eternal life. But this procession of the Son from the Father is, so to speak, projected into the world, when the Word becomes flesh and dwells among us, and shows us the Father, and the Spirit is sent into the world from the Father through the saving work of the Son. That's an attempt to represent the fire of Pentecost, which is the consequence of Christ's sacrifice. So here we have what St. Thomas calls the visible missions, something enacted in history, where the Word becomes flesh, and the Spirit, or the Spirit's sanctifying work, is symbolized by the dove, the fire, and the wind. But there were also invisible missions throughout history, from the beginning of the story of salvation with the preaching of the Gospel in the Garden of Eden, right to the end of human history, the Father is sending the Son and the Spirit to those whom he makes his friends. So if this is us, The Father sends his Son to abide within us and sends the Spirit to abide within us. And when that happens, we have to be likened to the divine persons, conformed to them by some gift of grace. And in the case of the Holy Spirit, who is the divine love in person, we are conformed to the Spirit by the virtue of charity. The Son is the divine wisdom of the God. The divine word. So something shaping the human intellect will correspond to the presence of the Son, but it's not faith, because it is possible to have a dead faith that does not work by love. There is one intellectual gift that is inseparable from charity, and that is wisdom. Wisdom is the kind of knowledge that bursts forth in love, reflecting how the Son 
together with the Father, is the source of the Holy Spirit. So we, so to speak, participate in the Spirit by charity and in the Son by wisdom. If you want a more modern and attractive account of this, then Matthias Josef Schäben, the 19th century neo-scholastic, wrote a book, The Mysteries of Christianity, and the 1941 German edition incorporated the revisions he was making when he died, and it was published in English in 1947. And chapter 7 is very attractively on those missions. It's worth mentioning now that, of course, the word wisdom, sapientia, can have several meanings. There is a worldly wisdom rejected by St. James in his letter, chapter 3. Phys philosophy or metaphysics is a kind of wisdom, a kind of overview of everything. And theology is a kind of wisdom, an overview of how all things come from God and find their fulfilment in God. But this wisdom is the wisdom from above that St. James speaks of, which is not given in proportion to our intellectual powers, but in proportion to our love. And it's that wisdom, that divine wisdom, which we are speaking of here. If you are looking for a research project, then I can identify two more. One would be, how are we conformed to the Father by his presence? The Father gives himself to us. There must be, presumably, some kind of conformity to the Father. And my tentative theory is that it is this gratia gratum factions, this sanctifying grace, this sharing in the divine nature, as St. Peter puts it. Because for St. Thomas, so to speak, in the depths of our being, we share in the divine nature. And just as the powers of the soul flow from its essence, so from the grace that transforms what we are, flow the virtues of which charity is the chief, and the gifts of the Spirit, of which wisdom is the chief. In the Divine Trinity, the wisdom and the love flow from the Father. In the life of grace, wisdom and charity flow from our sharing in the Divine Nature. There seems to be a Trinitarian structure to the life of grace. And that might be worth exploring. And another project would be to try to draw some connection between this sense that the divine persons, so to speak, form or shape us, and Rana's idea that the self-giving of the divine persons is a matter of them forming or shaping us at that spiritual level. So the answer to life, the universe, and everything is 43. We should backtrack slightly and look at what St. Thomas has to say about the Trinity in the earlier questions of the summer, chiefly 27 up to 42. And there, St. Thomas goes back to St. Augustine in a certain way. It is known, and it is sometimes complained, as Lydia pointed out, that St. Augustine tends to use a single human psyche as the best model, perhaps, of the Trinity. 
He is keen about how everything in creation bears the traces or the footprints of the Trinity and points to God. In the second half of the De Trinitate, he explores how the mind, its knowledge and its love, or the memory, the intellect and the will, are a kind of image of the Trinity. The structure of the De Trinitatis suggests he is not trying to prove the Trinity by looking at us. In the first half, he explores the revealed doctrine of the Trinity, and it's in the light of that that he can explore a Trinitarian structure in us. It is not to be implied that God simply is a big, self-thinking and self-loving mind. I think what we have, to some extent, is a model that gives us some little purchase on the Trinity that transcends our powers to comprehend. And I would like to claim, but it's a different topic, that this Augustinian psychological model of the Trinity brings out more sharply than any social model the radical unity and the radical rich diversity of the Holy Trinity. If you think of the Trinity in terms of three human persons writ large, then you have three of the same, and there's a danger of tritheism. But if with Augustine and Aquinas you look at mental dynamics, the mind or the memory, and knowledge and love, then you have three realities which aren't in competition with each other. The better they work, the more equal they are to each other, the more they interpenetrate, but they are irreducibly distinct, which is why you can't add the Father to the Son to the Spirit to make three anything. I think there's an A-team of theologians, Athanasius, Augustine and Aquinas, who are all a bit reticent about three words applied to God. Athanasius prefers to speak of one hypostasis, though he agrees that some people legitimately speak of three. Augustine and Aquinas are a bit reticent about how much one can really get out of trace persona. Really, there is one fatherhood, which as such has no thing in common with the divine sonship, which as such has no thing in common with proceeding as love. You can't really add the Father to the Son to the Spirit to make three of the same any more than you can add an inch to an ounce to a minute. You can step back and speak of three units of measurement, which is extremely valuable, and that's how the phrase traced for Soma is for St. Thomas. But if the Trinity is the supreme archetype of unity and diversity, that makes it a better archetype for human community. So there is, in fact, another research project to explore the social implications of the Western doctrine of the Trinity. There is some difference between Augustine and Aquinas in that in the second part of the day, Trinitate, for Augustine, the spirit is like the bond of love between and enfolding the Father and the Son. But St. Thomas does not like that. It muddles up the Trinitarian order. 
for St. Thomas. The Spirit is love, the feeling. <coughs> so St. Thomas draws on the first of those Augustinian models, if you like, when he tries to gain us some purchase on the Holy Trinity, when setting out the doctrine of the Trinity, the mind, its knowledge, and its love. He leaves to one side, at that point, memory, intellect, and will, or it might be better, remembering, understanding, and loving. And as Lydia did attractively in the previous talk, we can, if you like, paraphrase St. Thomas's doctrine by saying that God the Father knows himself perfectly and conceives a perfect image, who is his Word and his Son, and co-eternally, but as a kind of second procession, by loving himself as known, he breathes forth a co-equal spiritus, a kind of impulse of love. And St. Thomas does say that in uttering his word, the Father utters himself and creatures. It is as if the Father is the artist or architect who knows beforehand what he will craft. We are foreknown from eternity in the divine word. And the Father goes out to create us through his word. But equally, the Father is like the artist or architect who delights in, who is in love with, what he will craft. We are eternally foreloved in the Holy Spirit. And it's out of that eternal love for us that the Father goes out to craft us through the Word and the Spirit. And then, going to the work of salvation, it is as if the Father is the friend who knows himself perfectly and utters himself into the world when the Word becomes flesh and reveals the Father to us and is the channel of the coming of the divine love for our salvation. That's very attractive. But if you actually read through St. Thomas, he seems a bit more reticent and tentative than I have just been. Perhaps he is wary of thinking of God as simply a bigger and better version of the human psyche. Perhaps he's afraid of seeming to prove the Trinity that we can only know of by revelation. So Thomas is willing to use a psychological model, if you like, of the Trinity, and it gives us the attractive idea that we are eternally known and loved by the Father in the Word and the Spirit. But we don't gain much purchase on the divine reality by doing this. And it seems to me that both for Augustine and for Aquinas, while we can use models to gain some purchase on the Trinity, we must not forget that the movement is in fact in the other direction, from God to us. God knows and loves us into being and crafts us further in the work of salvation. And so I think that by speaking of the image of the Trinity, both Augustine and Aquinas are doing something rather different from using models to gain some purchase on the Trinity. They are exploring our vocation. 
by being made in the image of the Trinity, we are set a project and a goal. And that's what we find in question 93 of the first part of the summer, which St. Thomas introduces by saying, we're considering the finis and the termin, the goal and the end product of God's production of the human being, insofar as we are said to be made to God's image and likeness. Incidentally, Thomas is not much fussed by a distinction between image and likeness in his Latin, though not, I think, in the Hebrew of Genesis 1. Similarly, too, though, likeness is ambiguous. It could be a kind of vague resemblance, something less precise than image, or it can be the perfection of the image as it becomes like the archetype. It seems to me that in his day, Trinitate, Augustine is pursuing his own personal research project, asking how it is at all possible for the human being to journey into God. Because the goal of the journey is to know God. But we make the journey by love, and yet you can't love what you don't somehow know. So how does the journey get started? And the answer in Augustine's De Trinitate is, we have in us a kind of pointer to the Trinity, something that already matches and is drawn to the Trinity. We are attracted to the Trinity by being in the image of the Trinity. It's a kind of inbuilt awareness of the triune God, obscured by sin, but not fully obliterated, needing to be reactivated by salvation. And the key quotation is at the foot of page four of your handout, and it's reused by St. Thomas in this question. So Augustine says, this trinity then of the mind is not therefore the image of God, because the mind remembers itself and understands and loves itself, but because it can also remember, understand and love him by whom it was made, and in so doing it is made wise itself. Let it then remember its God, after whose image it is made, and let it understand and love him. So Thomas agrees with Augustine that in the human being at lower levels and in the whole created world, there are vestigia, footprints, traces of the Trinity, but the human mind with its faculties of intellect and will, is a real image of God, the Trinity. But the image is capable of varying degrees. So at the start of the question 93, Thomas defines the terms of image. He says that the other animals are not in the image of God, the angels are, in some ways in a way that's more intense than we are, but in a less multiform way. And the human being, because of our powers of intellect and will, is in the image of the Trinity. And then he explores this in Article 4. God knows and loves himself, and it's in that that we can imitate God. So there are three levels of the image in us, and you have the quotation a quarter of the way down on page five. 
by nature, all human beings have an aptitude towards knowing and loving God. We can distort it, but not entirely lost by sin. And there can be a progress to the life of grace, whereby we habitually or actually know and love God, imperfectly under the conditions of this life. And then we can go higher to the life of glory, heaven, and become more fully like God by knowing and loving God perfectly as far as a creature ever can do that. So we have a sense of a journey, a pilgrimage, a vocation. The image that we are by nature is by nature apt to know and love God. It's not just that we can know and love ourselves, but we are made apt by nature, by God's crafting, to know and love God. And we are drawn higher and higher to come to our perfection in an active communion with God. We are made in the image of the Holy Trinity for communion with the Trinity. We are made for the image to come to its perfection in communion with its exemplar. So God wants to go out to be known and loved and makes us able to know and love him and to rise to that eternal communion. The rest of question 93 fills out some details, explaining more fully that we are in the image of the Holy Trinity, not just the divine nature, and it's in our mind, our intellect and will, that we are really in the image of the Trinity, though of course Thomas defends the doctrine of the resurrection of the body where the bliss that's in the mind overflows into glory for the whole human being. And then we have in Articles 7 and 8 a further sense of pilgrimage or journey. By having mental powers, we are in the image of the Trinity. But if those powers are shaped, formed, structured, energised by virtues, like charity, we are yet more in the image of the Trinity when we act using mind and will. We are mo even more in the image of the Trinity and when it's acting on God by knowledge and love, we are most in the image of the Trinity. <coughs> and so Article 7 at the foot of page 5 explains this. If we are in the image of the Divine Trinity, we must look for the image where the soul approaches as closely as possible to representing a specific likeness of the Divine Persons. Now, they are distinct on the basis of the procession of the Word and the procession I think it should be translated from the love connecting both. But in our soul, there can't be a word without actual thinking. Thomas agrees with Augustine that when we think, it's as if we utter an internal word, a word in the heart, before we speak it externally. So by actual thinking, we put forth a kind of word that we ponder. So it's in the acts of the mind that we form an internal word and then can break forth into love and to explain what goes on there, a simple analogy will suffice. 
I can have in my mind a habitual memory of how in the good old days every box of black magic had a dark cherry in recurring dark chocolate and civilization crumbled and they took them out of the box of black magic. <laughs> but by remembering that I can form a concept of these delicious chocolates and break forth into love for them. <laughs> and, uh, of course one can love higher things and one should love higher things. <laughs> Happily the love can now be requited because it is possible for my friends hint to go and buy me boxes just <laughs> of black cherries in liqueur in dark chocolate which I sometimes share with the brethren <laughs> depending on whether I am in Aristotle's term controlled or uncontrolled <laughs> If I were virtuous, then I would automatically share them. <laughs> so, we reflect the Trinity, even at the level of light and dark chocolate, and we can reflect the Trinity better and better with higher and higher objects of love. It's in this question 93 that St. Thomas does want to employ Augustine's triad of remembering, understanding and loving. Not just the mind, its knowledge and its love. But he rejects what Peter Lombard had said, that memory, understanding and will are three natural powers of the soul. Because for Augustine, because for Thomas, at the spiritual level, to know is to remember. If I say I remember learning about endoplasmic reticulum, then I have an imaginative journey back to sitting in the Babbage Lecture Theatre in Cambridge. <laughs> and hearing the lecturer in cell biology and she taught, taught us about the structure of the cell and her pendant would, would bang against her microphone and make a horrible banging noise that's my sense memory but if I say I remember what endoplasmic reticulum is I mean I possess that concept structure in my mind whether I'm conscious of it or not. And St. Thomas would then see memory as the habitual retention of knowledge and love. In my mind, in my intellect and in my will, I have concepts I'm not currently consciously using and I have priorities I'm not consciously, deliberately activating. But they are then part of me, and they can come forward in the thinking that leads to an internal word, and in deliberate choices of what priorities to pursue. So that, in a way, is St. Thomas's reworking of Augustine's Memoria Intellectus and Voluntas. And then, question 93, article 8, explains that we are most of all in God's image, as by knowing and loving we act on God, not on any creature. And that's a kind of rhetorical climax, I think, to this question. Quoting Augustine, the image of God is in the mind because it can remember, understand and love God by whom it was made. To come to our perfection as the image of God, we must in some specific way reflect the Divine Trinity. Reflecting the procession of the Word from the Speaker, 
and the love from both. We recognize the divine image in man on the basis of a word conceived from the knowledge of God. Verbum contractum de dei notitia. And on the basis of a love derived therefrom. Hence the image of God is found in the soul according as the soul is carried into God or is naturally apt to be carried into God. And that's a bit puzzling. It's okay for this life, by faith, by wisdom, by theology, our minds are structured. And we can bring forth a word, an act of faith, a sound judgment about what to do, a theological conclusion. And from doing that, we can be moved to make a further act of love of God, actualizing the charity that's in our will. But what about the beatific vision? We can hardly speak there, not that we really know much about it, but we can hardly speak of a habitual retention of knowledge and love, because surely the vision of God and our delight in God in eternity are very actual, not habitual. How can some kind of word come from that? In his discussion of the state of the soul between death and resurrection, Thomas does seem to think that from our knowledge of God we can draw forth new truths about God's beauty and wisdom, and perhaps the higher saints can speak about them to the lower, as the higher angels can speak to the lower, and there would then be new outbursts of love. Thomas did not live to write a mature treatise on the beatific vision, but it seems clear from what he has written that in eternity we rest together, participating in God's eternity. And I tentatively wonder, and here's another research project for someone to do, I tentatively wonder whether God's self-gift to the enlightened mind is what would take the place of memory, so to speak. But the human mind is never equivalent to God. The image is never equivalent to the archetype, even in heaven. We can never comprehend God fully, though we can love God wholly. God's self-giving to us is perhaps somehow meant with our creaturely reception of God and the love that flows from that. Just possibly that is how in heaven we will image most richly the Father uttering himself in his word who in the letter to the Hebrews is the impress of his substance and breathing forth the spirit of love. So, it's at this point that I should give a conclusion. The last bit, um, friendship with the Holy Spirit, conformity to Christ, must be your bedtime reading. But we have seen that for St. Thomas, we are creatively known and loved by the Father in his word and in his spirit. And they go out in creation to make us in the image of themselves, an image called to rise to communion with God, its exemplar, through the life of grace to the life of glory, from one degree of likeness to another. 
in friendship the Trinity want to give themselves to us, to be known and loved, possessed and enjoyed. They make us for that purpose, and they enlarge our hearts by grace and by glory, so that we can receive the divine self-gift. And that, I think, is something rather attractive and inspiring. Thank you.